Today, sending in the clowns, or the Australian market, is different. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and prop news with a distinctively Australian flavour. This is my weekly market update. So we'll start overseas and then we'll end talking about the Australian situation. And of course, it's been another volatile week to review with concerns relating to the Ukraine conflict, energy security and inflation risks stemming from higher commodities, all driving uncertainty and downside risk. President Joe Biden continued to up the ante on Moscow, calling on lawmakers to revoke Russia's most favoured nation status, which could end normal trade with Russia, leading to higher tariffs. And in the US, all three major stock benchmarks were lower, as investors continued to pay their exposure to interest rate sensitive sectors, in particular technology, before next week's Federal Reserve Policy Meeting. Fed policymakers are expected to vote for at least 25 basis point increase. Earlier bets of a 50 basis point rise have fallen away in the wake of the uncertainty from Russia's attack on Ukraine. After 25 basis point hike at the March meeting, we see the Fed delivering an additional five 25 basis point rate hikes this year, followed by four hikes in 2023 to end the year at 2.625%, Morgan Stanley's economic team said recently. Chairman Jay Powell will be walking a tightrope, balancing the needs to raise rates and rein in a more systemic rise in inflation with the need to avert a meltdown in credit markets, said Diane Swank, chief economist at Grant Thornton. The 10-year US Treasury yield steadied after climbing above 2% and the 30-year rate hit its highest level since May 2021. Inflationary pressure is adding to the strain on global markets, with little hope of progress in talks between Russia and Ukraine to end the conflict. In a note, Ned Davis Research said it lowered its exposure to stocks by 5% to 55% and increased its bond allocation to 30%. It has 50% in cash. Instead of a rally watch buy signal, we've gotten a bear watch sell signal, they said. U.S. consumer sentiment tumbled in early March to the lowest since 2011, and year-ahead inflation expectations rose to a four-decade high in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The University of Michigan's sentiment index dropped to 59.7 from 62.8 in February, according to the latest data. Consumers expect prices to rise 5.4% over the next year. That's the highest reading since 1981, according to the report. And the report showed the highest ever share of Americans expecting their findings to worsen in the coming year. Evidence of the growing toll inflation is having on incomes. Prices at the grocery store and gas pump were rising even before the war, which is now making those purchases that much harder. The relationship between spending and sentiment is loose, particularly in the short run, and real disposable income growth and other determinants of household budgets and finances are more important, said Scott Hoyt, a senior economist at Moody's Analytics. Support will also be coming from plentiful jobs and abundant available cash and credit for many. The volatility of income expectations may suggest consumers are struggling to understand how labour market tightness and inflation will impact their budgets. A gauge of current conditions decreased to 67.8% in early March, the lowest since 2009, and the survey's measure of future expectations declined to 54.4, the weakest since 2011. Inflation expectations over the next 5 to 10 years held at 3%. Expectations are sensitive to both the state of the stock market and gas prices, so we're not surprised to see this decline. Ian Shepherdson, chief economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics, said in the note, it could easily have been bigger and we are braced for further drops next month. While markets pricing interest rates see as many as six or seven hikes this year spread out during the Federal Open Market Committee's remaining seven meetings, economists say the Fed's quarterly forecast in the dot plot will show around four hikes for 2022, and they predict the Fed will follow through with five increases with no half-point moves. Investors have ramped up expectations for an aggressive Fed posture in the face of the highest inflation in four decades, but the economists say the outlook has become muted by uncertainty over Ukraine sanctions and surging commodity prices. The economists predict the Fed may raise rates by 1.25% this year and perhaps reaching 2.5% in 2024. 
There is much higher uncertainty than normal about the course of Fed policy and many, many cross currents, Roberto Pirelli, head of global policy research at Piper Sandler, said in a survey response. On net, the Fed is likely to be somewhat more cautious and dovish a result than it would have been otherwise. Chairman Jerome Powell told lawmakers last week he would recommend a quarter point rate hike at the March 15th 16th Federal Open Market Committee meeting, leaving little doubt in the view of economists that's the plan. Yet he's been vague about the pace of future increases and whether the policy group will consider larger half point hikes. So, the S&P 500 gave up intraday gains on Friday to remain on course for another weekly loss amid rising concerns about the strength of the consumer in the wake of the Russian-Ukraine war and expectations for the Federal Reserve to begin its tightening cycle next week. The S&P 500 fell 1.3% to 4,204, adding to a weekly fall of 2.88% and a year-to-date drop of 11.79%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 0.69% to 32,944, adding to a weekly fall of 1.99% and a year-to-date fall of 9.34%. And the Nasdaq dropped 2.18% to 12,843, with a weekly fall of 8.53% and a year-to-date fall of 17.9%. But the Nasdaq Golden Dragon Index, which comprises of Chinese tech listed in the US, dropped 10.8% on the day and is down 34% year-to-date. This sell-off came after the US Securities and Exchange Commission identified five Chinese companies that could be subject to delisting if they fail to comply with certain auditing requirements. Overall, consumer discretionary stocks led the broader market lower as investors digested data pointing to a wobbling consumer sentiment in the wake of surging inflation that rashed up a notch following the Russia-Ukraine war. Tesla and Etsy led the losses in consumer discretionary stocks, with the latter falling by more than 9%. Technology gains a day earlier proved short-lived as the sector resumed its sell-off. Big tech was mostly in the red with Apple and Meta platforms the biggest decliners, and indeed some are now talking about a tech crash 2.0. Meta was also under pressure by concerns that user growth could slow even further after Russia restricted access to the social media giant's Instagram platform and launched a criminal pro into the company. The investigation was opened after the social media giant changed its policy on hate speech to allow statements such as death to Russian invaders on its platform. European stocks edged higher, rebounding after the previous session's hefty losses, with investors digesting strong UK growth, the hawkish ECB stance, and the continuing war, of course. The DAX in Germany traded 1.3% higher to 13,628, adding to a 4.07% gain this week, although it's still down 14.21% year-to-date. The CAC 40 in France traded up 0.85% to 6,260, and is down 12.48% year-to-date while the UK's FTSE rose 0.8% to 7,099, and that's down just 3.1% year-to-date, and so it's outperforming compared to the other European markets. Data released earlier on Friday showed that the British economy rebounded much more than expected in January, with gross domestic product growing by 0.8% on the month after a 0.2% decline in December. All sectors positively contribute to GDP growth in January. Services was the main driver, contributing 0.6 percentage points, with production and construction both contributing 0.1 percentage points. The Bank of England meets next week, and those upbeat numbers can only bolster the chances of the central bank lifting interest rates for the third time in the space of three months. The further moves to punish Russia economically, including the United States, the European Union and other allied nations, removing Russia's most favoured nation trading status, which allows for the imposition of tariffs on a wide range of Russian goods, would thus hurt the country's economy further. Indeed, the Institute of International Finance on Thursday cut its 2022 Russian GDP growth expectations, saying Moscow's economy will contract by some 15% this year due to the severity of sanctions, having previously had a 3% growth estimate. The Russian stock market, of course, has been closed for the last nine days. The European Central Bank kept its interest rate steady at 0% as it handed down its own policy decision on Thursday, but it did surprise investors by taking a relatively hawkish tone, announcing it would be speeding up its plans to tighten monetary policy, phasing out all of its asset purchases in the summer if inflation fails to come down fast enough. This wind-down of monetary stimulus signals that the central bank's focus is on high inflation, rather than weaker economic growth. 
Deutsche Bank stocks rose 1.79% after the German lender announced that it paid 14% more in bonuses in 2021, rewarding staff for the bank's most profitable year in a decade. Deutsche Bank, which faced stinging criticism from investors and in politicians for its ongoing ties to Russia, said on Friday in a surprise move that it would wind down its businesses in that country. So Deutsche joins the ranks of Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, which were the first two major US banks to exit after Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Those moves will put pressure on other rivals. We are in the process of winding down our remaining businesses in Russia while we help our non-Russian multinational clients in reducing their operations. The bank said there won't be any new business in Russia. Fabio de Massi, a former member of the Bundestag and a prominent campaign against financial crime, said the Deutsche Bank had close ties with the Russian elite, many of whom faced sanctions and that the relationship where it involved criminal Russian activity had to end. Deutsche Bank had said that it has pared down its Russian footprint in recent years. This week it disclosed 2.9 billion euros in credit risk to the country and said exposure was, quote, very limited. And it also operates a technology centre with about 1,500 employees in Russia and opened a new main office in Moscow in December, which it said at the time represented a significant investment and commitment to the Russian market. The US Department of Justice has been investigating it for years over trades that authorities said were used to launder 10 billion out of Russia, which has led to the German bank being fined nearly $700 million. Deutsche Bank said on Friday that the DOJ probe is understood to be ongoing. The row over Russia came as Deutsche Bank disclosed in its annual report that it paid suing 8.8 million euros in 2021. That's a 20% increase from a year earlier. Overall, the lender paid 14% more, or 2.1 billion euros of bonuses in 2021, rewarding staff for the bank's most profitable year in a decade. Now, oil prices stabilised on Friday, but still look set for the largest weekly drop since November 2021, amid uncertainty over global production levels in a week marked by the talk of potential supply additions, mainly from the United Arab Emirates, as well as additional sanctions on Russia. WTI oil fell 3% to 109.20, but is still up more than 45% year-to-date and 66% higher over the past year. Fuel remain expensive, despite hopes that OPEC will up production to offset the withdrawal of Russian crude. Now that, of course, is inflationary. Now Asia-Pacific stocks were down on Friday, with Chinese stocks in the US dropping to a 14-year low. Investors also suggested data showing the highest US inflation in 40 years, which drove US bond yields higher and raised expectations that interest rate hikes will be steeper. Japan's Nikkei 225 fell 2.05%, 25,162, and is down 12.6% year to date. Data released earlier in the day showed that household spending grew 6.9% month on month, but contracted 1.2% year over year in January 2022. The Business Sentiment Index Large Manufacturing Conditions Index for the first quarter was down 7.6. Korea's Kospi index was down 0.71% and is down 10.62% year-to-date. Shanghai, though, rose 0.41% to 3,112 and is down 9.07% year-to-date. And the Hang Seng in Hong Kong fell 1.61% to 20,553 and is down 12.15%. China is experiencing its most significant COVID-19 outbreak since the early days of the pandemic, igniting a flurry of new restrictions and mitigation measures as the country's zero-tolerance approach to the virus is challenged like never before. Domestic infections topped 1,000 for the first time since the peak of the original Wuhan outbreak on Friday, a tally that has ballooned from just over 300 cases a day in less than a week. The country responded by locking down a city of 9 million people in the northeast and ordering the construction of makeshift hospitals there and in the eastern port city of Qingdao. An outbreak of the Omicron variant in Shanghai saw schools there shattered again, while officials are said to be looking at diverting all international flights away from the financial centre to ease pressure on quarantine hotels. China isolates all virus cases, including those in the community as part of its COVID-0 policy. In a move that may signal Beijing is expecting a further spike in cases, authorities also said they will allow the use of rapid antigen tests for the first time 
late Friday. While used widely in other parts of the world, rapid tests were previously restricted in China. Despite the swelling outbreak, China is seeing more people infected without obvious symptoms than those who were sickened by the virus, likely resulting from Omicron's diminished virulence and China's mass vaccination drive that's seen nearly 90% of its 1.4 billion people fully inoculated with locally developed shots and more than one third boosted. Of Friday's total caseload, 703 were asymptomatic. Now so to nickel, which shot off the scale this week, the market has been closed since the 8th of March. The drastic interventions have led some hedge funds to walk away from the London Metal Exchange, saying it's too risky to trade. The LME suspension of nickel trading after soaring prices to have brokers facing huge margin calls and so it's also upended the market for a key industrial commodity. Nickel is a key ingredient in stainless steel and electric vehicle batteries and the LME sets benchmark prices for the global industry. But in recent years, many consumers have come to favour other raw materials over the refined metal that underpins the contracts, leaving them as largely passive observers of this week's market meltdown is like an iceberg. You've got the top tradable above the surface, but there's a whole lot of material beneath that's pricing off it, said Peter Hanna, a commodities price development marketing manager at Fast Markets in Singapore. And you can't get those units onto the LME to ease a squeeze. They're just passengers on the vehicle. Concerns over potential disruption to Russian supply, combined with a mammoth short bet by Chinese tycoon Jay Kandu, propelled nickel to a 250% gain in two days. Before LME trading was halted on Tuesday morning, a huge disconnect emerged with Shanghai contracts, where maximum daily gains and losses are capped. Prices in Shanghai paired their advances on Thursday and Friday, but the fallout from the nickel squeeze is reverberating far beyond China. There was some good news, perhaps, as Indonesia, the world's top nickel producer, will raise production capacity of the metal after prices soared above $100,000 a tonne, while the coal market is unlikely to get similar relief. The country is set to add 393,000 tonnes to 400,000 tonnes of nickel in metal output capacity this year, bringing the total to as much as 1.4 million tonnes, according to Coordinating Minister for Investment and Maritime Affairs, Linda Next year, Indonesia will add another 500,000 tonnes of annual production capacity, he added. Indonesia will monitor the market situation before deciding on its planned export tax on ferro-nickel and nickel pig iron, given the unprecedented situation, he said. We need to be mindful of the impact to consumers, he added. We don't want to stifle the electric vehicle battery industry, and we don't want nickel prices to disrupt our target of producing lithium battery early in 2024. In Australia, the SX200 was down 0.94%, with Reserve Bank of Australia Governor Philip Lowe speaking earlier in the day. Across the Tasman Sea, New Zealand's business NZ Purchasing Managers Index was 53.6 in February. Reserve Bank of Australia Governor Phil Lowe has warned borrowers to start preparing for high interest rates as surging prices of commodities such as oil, gas and coal heap pressure on the central bank to increase rates to control rising inflation. Financial markets are now expecting five rate increases this year, with the first tip for July, according to the futures market, meaning the 0.1% record low official cash rate will exceed 1% by December. More than 1 million borrowers have never experienced an increase in the cash rate and asked if a rate increase could come as early as June, Dr Lowe declined to specify the timing. It's not guaranteed, but it's plausible, he declared, of the prospect of a 2022 tightening, though he has also framed an alternative plausible scenario where the cash rate stays on hold until 2023 or 2024. Well, remember, of course, the election is going to be in May, so he's pushing it out beyond the election. The underlying inflation level is not yet sustainably within the bank's 2 to 3% target, although forecasts paint a hot inflationary picture. Recent developments have moved us close to that point. Inflation has been higher than we were expecting, the governor said. One issue we're paying close attention to is the inflation psychology. For many years, firms were reluctant to put up their prices, and because they didn't want to put up their prices, they didn't want to put up wages. It's quite possible a period of projected headline inflation will see this psychology shift. The war in Ukraine has radically altered the global monetary dynamic to one of slower growth and high inflation for energy importers 
and more favourable terms of trade for energy exporters. High commodity prices have pushed Westpac to upgrade the Australian dollar outlook. The horrific developments in Ukraine have turbocharged commodity prices, said Chief Economist Bill Evans. It will hit 76 US cents by the end of this year and would be higher if not for the conflict in Europe, which has hurt resentment. The Bloomberg Commodities Index, a benchmark that tracks the price of 23 raw materials integral to the global economy, including Brink crude and iron ore, has dropped by more than a quarter this year. And on Friday, Australia joined a widening global ban against Russian oil, gas and coal in retaliation against the invasion of Ukraine. Although Australia does not import large amounts of Russian energy, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne said the decision was aimed at imposing economic pain. Taking this action with key partners will collectively curtail Russia's revenue and ability to finance Russian President Vladimir Putin's unjustified war against Ukraine, she said. Stephen Kukulis, the managing director of Market Economics, said the war was influencing monetary policy decisions. In a perverse way, it may speed up the need for higher interest rates. In Australia, he said, with the lift in inflation that we are going to see inevitably with the lift in commodity prices, there are implications for interest rates. But the forces of rising inflation might be more mixed than financial markets are currently reflecting. Higher prices for fuel and food, for instance, will absorb the money consumers would otherwise direct to other parts of the economy, weighing on economic growth. The impact of what is happening in Ukraine on food and commodity prices means the RBA is less likely to raise rates before August, said independent economist Saul Eslake. The RBA wants to see if headline inflation is feeding through to core inflation in a lasting way. The divergence between financial market expectations and the RBA's view of the economy narrows a rocky period between investors and Dr Lowe, who has in the past lashed out against the bond market for betting aggressively on rate increases. Phil Lowe seems to be determined not to be bullied by financial markets into rising rates until he thinks it is appropriate, Mr S. Lake said. Mr Evans said high headline inflation has raised some genuine concerns for the RBA around inflation expectations and Westpac forecasts a lift-off arriving in August. However, the spectre of significant risk and lower global growth, particularly in Europe, should see the RBA remaining patient over the next few months. CBA predicts a rate rise at the RBA's June meeting. And Australian government bonds have crept up to multi-year highs, in part reflecting expectations for higher interest rates. The Australian three-year bond yield touched 1.85% on Friday, a level not reached since January 2019, and steadied at 1.82%. 10-year yields rose as far as 2.42%, the highest since December 2018, and traded at 2.40% by midday on Friday. The increase in commodity prices has helped Australia sidestep much of the pain felt across global share markets since Russia invaded Ukraine, easing its relative decline for the year. The S&P SX200 has fallen 5.1% in 2022, less than half the 10.6% tumble for US blue chips and the 7.8% drop for the MSCI World Benchmark Index. Vivek Dar, a commodities analyst with CBA, said the effect of war in Ukraine would have significant implications for the Australian economy. The financial markets are riding a wave of fear, he said. Prices have jumped because demand in the short term is very inelastic. It can't shift quickly and there is just no supply. That's why prices have skyrocketed. Australian energy producers can expect improved revenues. Iron ore, Australia's top export, has also drifted higher through the Ukraine-Russia conflict, despite neither economy being a big exporter in their own right. The iron ore price increases that we saw during COVID-19 was because of the infrastructure demand in China, he said. If you want to stimulate the sector, steel demand will push the price of iron ore higher. Iron ore that's traded in the spot market fell 0.8% to $156.35 US dollars a tonne on Thursday, according to S&P Global. The May-Brent contract was down 0.1% to 109.19 a barrel on Friday. That said, the Australian share market fell over the past week, weighed by losses from the materials sector as sky-high commodity prices retreated significantly, forcing miners to hand back some of their gains in the past month. The ASX 200 fell 47.2 points, or 0.7%, to 7,063, led by a 0.9% decline on Friday. While energy and metal prices spiked at the start of the week, those prices unwound amid signs that Ukraine was open to making concessions to Russia in order to secure a peaceful deal. 
BHP led the losses, falling 4.5% to 47.69, as the price of iron ore and other base metals tailed off towards Friday. Rio Tinto slid 11.7% to 111.70, and Fortescue Metal Group declined 5.1% to 1823. Deterra Royalties lost 9.1% to $4.10. The decline in base and other metal prices at the week's end also hurt smaller miners. South 32 slid 5.4% to 4.89. Then as rare earths declined 4.6% to 10.25, and samphire resources dropped 6.9% to 5.50. Nickel mines tumbled 25.2% to $1.20 on the news that its stainless steel producer Tangxing, which has a partnership agreement with nickel miners, held a large short position in LME nickel that spiked to a record high of $100,000 US a tonne midweek. The company withdrew its share purchase plan at the end of the week following the heavy price fall. Tech stocks were also in the firing line, extending their poor run of form. Zero slid 5.4% to 92.78. Block fell 4.3% to 146.40. And Zipco tumbled 8.4% to $1.58. And Altium dropped 7.2% to $30.73. The big four banks, though, had strong gains. CBA advanced 5.1% to 99.38. NAB firmed 3.6% to 29.94. ANZ added 2.2% to 25.85. And Westpac climbed 2.1% to 22.67. Gold miners also supported the market gains. North Star Resources rose 6.7% to $10.80. Newcrest Mining firmed 3.2% to $26.85. Evolution Mining added 5.5% to $4.43. St. Barbara advanced 16.2% to $1.58. And Gold Road Resources rose 11.9% to $1.78. The global tech sell-off sent Magellan's flagship global fund 7.1% lower on Friday as the money managers battled to persuade retail and institutional clients to stay invested in its fund. Shares in the group closed down 6.8% to $14.20 near a March 8, 52 week low of $13.76, which equaled their lowest level since November 2014. The $11.9 billion Magellan Global Fund, still listed as run by absent co-founder Hamish Douglas and portfolio manager Avrid Stragman, has underperformed its benchmark by 9.1% over the past year after returning 9.1% net of fees and including dividends reinvested versus the 18.2% for its benchmark, the MSCI World Net Total Return Index. Over the past five years, the global fund has returned 11.7% net of fees versus 13.4% for its benchmark. On February the 11th, Magellan's temporary investment boss, Chris McKay, told an investor webinar that he regularly discussed the meta holding with Mr. Douglas. Magellan's new co-portfolio manager, Nikki Thomas, appointed in Mr. Douglas' absence, told the webinar meta is now one of the fund's smaller positions and she said she's comfortable with it. Towards the end of 2020, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and associated global lockdowns, Magellan also bought into high-growth home entertainment business Netflix. Critics questioned the investment's timing after lockdowns brought forward demand for Netflix subscriptions. Over the past 12 months, Netflix shares are down 31.8% as subscriber growth slowed, in line with the pandemic's power to keep citizens at home, although it's undisclosed how the Netflix holding has performed relative to its benchmark. Other co-holdings in the global fund's portfolio included Google parent Alphabet, which reported better than expected earnings on January, on February the 1st, fizzy beverage giant PepsiCo, coffee store franchise of Starbucks, drug maker Novartis, and payment giant Visa and MasterCard. The fund's cash holding is at 9% as at February the 28th. It targets a 4% annual cash distribution and describes itself as a benchmark portfolio of 20 to 40 high quality stocks. The group's script is down 66% over a horror 12 months, though it includes significant underperformance of some investment funds, the resignation of its former chief executive Brett Cairns on December 6th, and a medical leave of absence for co founder Mr. Douglas from February the 7th. And Mr. Douglas also took an as yet unexplained trip to Europe over several months in the middle of 2021 at the same time as he was chief investment officer, lead portfolio manager and chairman of the international money manager. 
On February 25th, Magellan revealed it suffered $3.2 billion in net retail and institutional fund outflows over a two-week period from February 11th to leave total funds under management at $77.2 billion as at February 23rd versus $87.1 billion as at February 11th. Now, finally, dramatic global events often lead to dramatic calls from financial market commentators and analysts. But in the week that features horrible scenes from Ukraine, fresh scandals on Russia and extraordinary action in commodity markets, one pronouncement stood out. The probability of a civilization ending nuclear war now sits at an uncomfortably high 10%. The analysis produced by a Canadian firm called BCA Research, naturally went viral. But it wasn't just the prediction of nuclear Armageddon that stood out. BCA also had some simple advice for investors. Buy stocks. Despite the risk of nuclear war, it makes sense to stay constructive on stocks over the next 12 months. If an intercontinental ballistic missile is heading your way, the size and composition of your portfolio becomes irrelevant, the firm wrote. Thus, from a purely financial perspective, you should largely ignore existential risk, even if you do care about it greatly from a personal perspective. You can only surmise the firm's tongue was at least partly in its collective cheek. But investors do appear to have taken BCA's advice and ignored the threat posed by the conflict. Was the war already priced in? Or is the resilience a sign investors are more focused on what the Federal Reserve does with US interest rates next week than what Putin does in Ukraine over the next few months? Or are equity investors underestimating the seismic shifts that the most dramatic conflict since World War II has set off? There are potentially two ways the war could play out. The first is the redrawing of the global energy map. Sanctions imposed on Russian energy exports this week by the United States and Britain, which have sent oil and gas prices to near record levels, have ushered in a new era of energy insecurity, Woodside Chief Executive Meg O'Neill has said. This is not just about how Russian cargoes are replaced in the short term, something Santos Chief Executive Kevin Gallagher said, but is all but impossible. Rather, O'Neill argues that Western nations will now be much more selective about whom they rely on to provide their energy needs. While this will probably result in a tilt towards like-minded suppliers in Australia and the United States, broader shortages of oil and gas and higher prices look certain and volatility looks guaranteed. The second major trend was called up by Scott Morrison and Chief Intelligence Advisor Andrew Shearer, who both warned a period of dangerous geopolitical instability was certain. The Quad and AUKUS showed it's not just Australia that's in the crosshairs of China's assertiveness, the National Intelligence Chief Andrew Shearer said. The pair made it clear Australia would need to become more self-reliant. This will include sharply increasing defence spending, but also building stronger manufacturing capability at home and shortening supply chains by pulling back from the globalised, just-in-time world we knew before the pandemic. Clearly, Morrison and his party are intent on playing the national security card in full campaign mode, but the Prime Minister is hardly alone in ramping up that type of rhetoric. As Matthew Klein, author of the influential macroeconomic policy newsletter The Overshoot wrote this week, a global increase in capital spending to promote self-sufficiency or at least supply chain resiliency and to limit the risks of security-related disruption seems likely, while an increase in military spending is also clearly underway. Australia may actually be well-placed, given our position as one of the CARBN group of commodity exporters, that's Canada, Australia, Brazil, Russia and Norway. Local investors can get exposure to producers of many of those commodities that are soaring now and probably have further to run from oil and gas to wheat to aluminium to nickel. As Lowe argued this week, higher income from higher commodity prices should also provide the Australian economy with a buffer from broader inflationary pressures. But the threat of stagflation caused by the Ukraine conflict where interest rates rise and economic growth slows, hangs heavily over large chunks of the ASX and indeed global markets. Exactly how this plays out in individual stocks is, of course, difficult to predict. But an environment of heightened concerns about energy and geopolitical security, the potential for unexpected second and third order effects seem much greater than equity investors are currently anticipating. And this takes me to my final point today. There is so much uncertainty, and yet there is so much which is unknown and unknowable at the moment. 
And I don't think investors are able to factor in all of those unknown unknowns, to quote old Rumsfeld, which suggests to me that the chances of markets going further south is much stronger than them recovering anytime soon, which again signals to me caution. And whether you decide to go into the markets and into bonds or whether you stay in cash and wait is an individual decision. But this uncertainty is not going to unwind anytime soon. And frankly, the idea that Australia is in some way uniquely able to separate itself from these events and therefore our markets will continue to perform very strongly and yet inflationary pressures will remain much weaker than around the world both seem to me a bit laughable. Like it or not, we are connected to what is going on globally and our financial markets very much joined at the hip. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.